Good evening and welcome to a very special evening. We are honored to host this informal conversation with the right Reverend Professor N.T. Wright. And this evening we will have Dr. David Lauber and Dr. Keith Johnston leading this discussion for us. This is um, part of our Christ at the Core Fall Series, our second annual Fall Series for Christ at the Core. Here at Wheaton College, under the new Christ at the Core curriculum, half of our student body has now read Dr. Wright's book, Simply Christian. Each student, their first semester here on campus, reads Simply Christian for their first year seminar class, one of our Christ at the Core courses. And so what we've done for tonight is we've collected from our students their questions. And we've also gathered questions from the faculty who teach the first year seminar. And that's what the conversation will be based around, those questions for Dr. Wright. Thank you for coming. And I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Keith Johnson and Dr. David Lauber. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wright, again for being here, not just tonight, but yesterday in your wonderful chapel address and your lecture last evening and meeting with faculty and students over the last couple of days. I want to begin with a, an introductory question about Simply Christian. Uh, it's about 10 or 11 years old by now, and so I'd love to hear you talk about how you came to write the book, Simply Christian. How did it come about? What might you have learned as you were writing it? Uh, and if you were to write a second edition, uh, what kinds of changes or additions would you make? Yeah, thank you for that. And thanks very much to all of you for being here, but especially to those of you who've read the book and those who had the bright idea of assigning it in the first place. It's really, really exciting. Um, you know, uh, as a scholar, you hope that some professors sometime will assign one of your books to a class of maybe 20 students, but the thought of an entire student body getting to grips with it is wonderful. So I'm, I'm just flattered and honored that that would be so and delighted to be here with you. Um, I was asked to do Simply Christian, we didn't call it that then, but we searched for a title, by HarperCollins back in the late 1990s, I think 1999 or maybe on the cusp of 2000, something like that. Um, and what they said was, uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis has been read by millions and has helped millions of people to come into Christian faith. But that was written like 50 years before. And uh, it's quite dated in some ways. It's still a brilliant book, but it's quite dated. Could you do something like that for the 21st century? And that was just a wonderful challenge, which I was really excited by. Um, but then I realized this is actually going to be quite difficult because the whole question of where you start for a non-believer, for an outsider, has been really, really controversial in uh, recent Christianity because some people have imagined that you can simply lay a foundation of things that every sane human being will agree on and then you kind of work up from there to God with a QED at the end. And most of us think that life isn't like that that the world is more complicated, actually more interesting than that. So where are you going to begin? And so for about five years, from maybe 1999 through till early 2005, this was a question that was going around in the back of my mind while I was working on lots of other projects at the time. I kept coming back to this question. And eventually, in 2004-05, somebody from HarperCollins wrote to me and said, uh, we gave you this contract five years ago, and we want this book. And I started to get nervous. What, how am I going to do this? So I did some lectures around the Diocese of Durham, where I was bishop. In, um, I started there in 03. And I was trying out some of the ideas, particularly the ones at the beginning of the book, um, which, as you know, the whole themes of justice and spirituality and relationships and beauty, and seeing these as, in the phrase of the book, echoes of a voice, and trying that line of thought out and trying to fine-tune it until I thought, yeah, I think we can go with this. And then finally, after five years of preparation, it was five days of frantic writing. Um, and it was Easter week in 2005, and my wife took me off up to a little cottage in Northumberland with the computer and basically um, shut me in the room and didn't let me out till it was done, nearly. It, w it wasn't quite that easy, but it was something like that. And uh, so, so that, that, that's basically the story of it. If I was to do it again now, 
I, there's a couple of things I, I would quite like to do, but it would make it a longer book, and I'm not sure if that would necessarily help. But the same argument that I ran about justice and spirituality and relationships and beauty, I would also want to talk about freedom and truth and power. And you have exactly the same paradoxes with those. These are things everybody knows is important, are important, but uh, none of us can get right. And there's an oddity about that, and then the same uh, pick up from that would happen later on in the book as happens with the four that we've got. The other thing was that I originally intended to have a final section of the book talking about Christian faith and other faiths and about Christian hope and other hopes and Christian love and other loves. In other words, to do faith, hope and love and saying, so what's different about Christianity? Uh, that never got written and I said to the publishers, but I was going to do that last bit and they said, no, the book's quite long enough already, we'll stop it right there. Um, so you got what you got and I've still never written those last three sections. Well, as you know, or as you may have heard, our first year seminar is structured around certain outcomes that we hope every student will meet. And one of our outcomes is that every student who takes our course will be able to explain the gospel in light of the biblical narrative um, using basic theological vocabulary. And so some students wanted to hear you do that. Um, <laughs> maybe they're wanting some help on their assignment or something. <laughs> Quite um, yeah. So to make this concrete, imagine that you have been invited to visit with someone on his or her deathbed and you realize that you have the opportunity to share the gospel, what would you say? I think it, it really depends entirely who the person is, whether they're already a member of a church, whether it might be a family member. The, the, the last person I saw in his deathbed was actually my own father, and uh, I knew exactly where he was in his, um, in his own spiritual journey, and that was great, I just prayed with him. Um, and obviously, as a priest and as a bishop, I've been in that situation many times, and there is no one-size-fits-all. And that's really important to say, because you can't just have a formula which you drag down and apply to all situations and hope it'll work. However, supposing, for your hypothesis, that this is somebody I don't actually know and who is too far gone to be very articulate about what sort of faith they have, I think what I would want to communicate, and I would have to trust the Spirit to give me the words at the time, would be that the God who made the world is remaking the world, that he has launched that in Jesus, defeating everything that destroys his good purpose, and he wants you to be part of this new world. In other words, new creation focused on what's happened through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and now inviting you to be part of it. And I think actually, that's quite simple, people can get hold of that, but the idea of a new creation is so different from, never mind this death business because you're going somewhere else. Uh, yeah, death matters. Death is the denial of the goodness of God's creation, but God has already begun the business of remaking the world by dealing with everything that's evil on the cross, including everything in your life, I might say, which has not been what God wanted, and now he's doing this new creation thing and you get to be part of it even right now. On a related theme. If um, you say that, you'll get an A, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the major themes of your book, and one that prompts a lot of discussion among our students, is your claim that in ancient Jewish and, and Christian theology, heaven and earth overlap and they interlock. You relate this idea often to the resurrection and to your what you call life after life after death. And these ideas prompt many questions from students because many of them have grown up with a view of salvation, which involves leaving earth and going directly to heaven when you die. And so we were wondering if you could talk about your view of heaven and earth and the resurrection and explain what we lose if we separate heaven and earth instead of seeing them as overlapping and interlocking. Wow, yeah. The, the, the short answer is there's a book called Surprised by Hope, which, which <laughs> explain, ex, explains all this. Available but, for sale outside. Yeah, yeah, uh, is it? I didn't know. Um, <clears throat> I think I first became aware that the language I'd grown up with about heaven was inadequate when I was, as, uh, as a priest in the Church of England, when I was regularly celebrating the Eucharist and realized that I was saying day after day and week after week, therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, etc., 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 and realizing that this wasn't a sort of imaginary thing that we had to pretend that we were upstairs somewhere when in fact we were downstairs, um, but that actually uh, 
And the more you look at the relevant biblical bits, the more sense it makes. Um, the Christian sacraments, and I think this is widely believed not only in the more Catholic or Orthodox traditions, that the Christian sacraments are one of those moments when and one of the places where and one of the events through which God's world and our world do overlap and interlock. See, my body language is already doing it. My, my hands are coming together instinctively without me intending it because that, the idea of the interpenetration of heaven and earth seems to me to go back to Genesis, seems to me to come all the way forward to Revelation. And that's part of the point of what Jesus says. This is the time for the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, as we're taught to pray, is on earth as in heaven. And that's not, uh, you know, I think when I was young, I used to pray that prayer and imagine that that was just kind of about my own life, that one day we'll be in heaven and that'll be where the kingdom of God will really happen. And um, wouldn't it be nice, please, if I can have a little bit of that here and now? Well, in a sense, that's better than not thinking like that but at all, but much better to say that in Jesus, the coming together of heaven and earth has begun, and in the Spirit, that coming together happens in a whole new way. This is what the story of Pentecost is all about. It's, it's uh, the description of the rushing mighty wind coming into the house is meant, I think, to evoke, and the event is meant to evoke, um, the times when in the Old Testament um, the presence of God fills the tabernacle in the wilderness in Exodus 40 or Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 8. This is the new temple, which means it's where heaven and earth get together. Um, we have to go on saying this in so many ways because it is so counterintuitive in, in Western Christianity. The Eastern Orthodox have no trouble with this at all. This is where they live. Um, it's why they do liturgy the way they do. They have other problems which I wouldn't want, want to go to, but on this I think they're absolutely right. So likewise with life after life after death and that that phrase seems to me so clear that I'm puzzled that people don't understand it but I've had to draw it out on the board for for students and say okay here we are this is ordinary life then there is death and then according to the New Testament what we're promised is resurrection that does not happen immediately after death it didn't happen to Jesus immediately after death he had to wait three days and uh, Paul talks about going and being with the Messiah, which is far better. But then in the same letter towards the end, he talks about the Messiah will come and will change our humiliated body to be like his glorious body. So it's a two-stage post-mortem reality. He has ordinary life, then there's death, then there's whatever life after death is, which actually the New Testament is not terribly interested in. And then there is the new day which will dawn when, when Jesus returns, and he returns precisely not to scoop people up from earth and take them off somewhere else, but to transform this present world and to raise his people from the dead to populate this new world which he's going to make to be the royal priesthood within it. And once you see that, it's so clear right across the New Testament that it's a puzzle in a way why we haven't got that right. And the answer, I think, to that goes back to the Middle Ages. This is not a modern problem. This is, I think, a medieval problem. Um, and it's a medieval Western problem. And then the reformers reform the way you talk about going to heaven and manage to get rid of purgatory, which was quite nice. Um, but, uh, but they're still thinking in terms of heaven being the eventual destination. And you can see it in the iconography. If you go to older churches where they have frescoes on the wall in parts of Italy, for instance, if you go back far enough, you will have pictures of people being raised from the dead into new bodies. But then at some point, at about, I think, the 14th or 15th century, they lose that, and instead it's about going to heaven. And that's, that's a measure of just how far we went away from what the New Testament is saying. Sorry, there was a huge double question, so quite a long answer. So could you draw that into the difference it makes if you, if you lose that sense of the interlocking? What on the ground in the Christian life, what have you seen yeah. that's, a, that's affected by that loss? Uh, I, where I would go is to 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the last verse of Paul's great long chapter on the resurrection. Because for so many Western Christians, if you say, yes, God is going to do this new thing and there will be this wonderful, blissful, eternal life or something, then who cares about what we do here other than vaguely keeping our noses clean just in case? You know, though, if you believe in justification by faith, we'll probably talk about it later. But instead, Paul says, no, because God is going to raise the dead and make this new world, what you do in the present matters. He says, 
keep on with your work because in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And the illustration which I've used, which helps me to get this, um, comes from my time when I was working in one of the medieval cathedrals in England. And there's a stonemason's yard just down the road, which has been there since the med medieval times, because you're always having to do um, new bits of stone for an ancient cathedral. But I imagine people working on the cathedral in the first place, and the stonemason being told, um, you carve this bit of stone with this pattern on. It will take you six weeks to get it right and do this and that. And the guy's probably illiterate. He's just obeying orders. But one day, one day, the master mason will come and take all the bits of carved stone and up the rickety scaffolding and, and the, mace, the, the stone carver will look and see that the little thing that he was working on means a hundred times more than he'd ever imagined because it's part of this great new building. In other words, what we do in the present may seem small and insignificant, but one day, if we are in Christ and by the Spirit now, it will be part of God's new, uh, new world. And this is what Jesus says when he says, if you give a cup of cold water to somebody because they're part of the messianic team, you won't lose your reward. In other words, even the small acts of mercy and justice and wisdom and beauty that you do in the present, somehow in ways we don't know, will be part of God's new world. The resurrection therefore validates retrospectively all that is done in the present uh, to be kingdom work. We're not building the kingdom ourselves. God builds God's kingdom. We are working for the kingdom, which is what Paul says. Phew. Okay. Got that straight? Now that we handled that easy question, uh, we'll take on another question. Um, and in my own first year seminar, we spent quite a bit of time talking about this particular section from your book, and it's related to Christ and his divinity. Okay. And many students, um, not only in my section, but across the sections, have raised questions about your understanding of the divinity of Jesus, especially as it's related to his own self-awareness, um, his vocational awareness. So it'd be wonderful if you could help us out right. with that. Yeah, no, I understand. And th th this, is, uh, this has been a mystery to many wonderful minds for 2,000 years because when we're talking about Jesus, we are, we are at the borders of language because this is the most extraordinary event that's ever taken place in human history, the complex of things concerning Jesus. So we shouldn't be, by way of saying, we shouldn't be surprised that we find it difficult here. We ought to find it difficult. If we think we've got it sewn up, we've probably oversimplified it. Okay, the book is called Simply, but don't oversimplify. Um, <laughs> I, I would like to start where we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, particularly in Matthew and Mark. Um, the, the Lucan and Johannine accounts are slightly different, but in Matthew and Mark, Jesus is in agony in Gethsemane, and he prays that maybe there is some other way. And, and he, he, please take this cup away from me. I can't bear it. I don't want to drink it. Now, this does not look to me like somebody who is striding through life knowing that he is divine, remembering what it was like when he was upstairs with the Father beforehand when the angels were bringing him bananas on golden bowls or whatever they do. Um, I mean, I've heard people talk almost exactly like that. It's not, a, not that much of a caricature. And that's a docetic Jesus, a Jesus who isn't really human but only seems to be. One of the things that the letter to the Hebrews insists on, one of the things that Paul insists on in Philippians 2 in that great poem, is that part of the meaning of what it, what it was to be Jesus, to be equal with God, was to go through that, to go through crises of vocation. Because actually, the most important knowledge in the world is not two plus two equals four, it's analytically true. It's not even knowing that I'm sitting in a chair, isn't that fine, I actually know that I'm sitting in a chair. I'm a critical realist, I could just be dreaming this, but I really do think this is a chair I'm sitting on. But that's actually comparatively trivial compared with the knowledge that my wife and my children love me, or compared with the knowledge of the beauty of an amazing painting or a great symphony or compared with the knowledge that I really do believe God called me to be a priest, a preacher of the gospel, uh, a bishop and a theologian. Now, when I was younger, I hoped I had glimpsed that vocation. Now that I'm nearly 70 and I've been doing it for 45 years or so, I think I can say 
as humbly as I can, I think it's true. I really did believe that God was calling me to do these things, and I believe that that, that belief was true. But vocation is a hard-won thing, and one can easily be self-deceived. And the first century was full of people who thought they might be the Lord's anointed and who tended to end up being killed by the occupying forces. Now, go figure. Jesus must have known that a vocation like that was a risk. In other words, it wasn't just an easy way. Yeah, of course, I'm the second person of the Trinity, so this is what we've got to do. I see Jesus making prayerful, difficult, tough decisions. And to the extent that I grew up in a world where people talked about the divinity of Jesus in such a way as to mean that he wouldn't ever have to make difficult, tough decisions, I say, I'm sorry, I just don't see that in the text. And so when you get to Philippians 2 and say, though he was equal with God, he, though he was in the form of God, he did not regard his equality with God as something to exploit, but emptied himself, etc., etc. I think Jesus, the one we call Jesus, was and is the second person of the Trinity in later language. Um, but the, the mysterious thing is that we don't come with knowing who God is and then fit Jesus into that. We are invited by the New Testament to start with Jesus and reconfigure the meaning of the word God around that, including particularly Gethsemane and the cry of dereliction on the cross. That is perhaps one of the two or three biggest theological challenges that we face as Christians. We constantly have to do what John says. No one has ever seen God but the only begotten Son. He has exegeted him. He has shown us, explained to us who God really is. That remains mysterious intellectually, spiritually. But that's what I was trying to get at. And if anyone thought, oh dear, N.T. Wright doesn't believe in the divinity of Jesus, then please read it more carefully. Because I actually, of course I don't say that. Um, uh, Jesus, I think, is identical, the, the human being Jesus is identical with the one who from all eternity was equal with God, whatever language you want to use for that. Is that, is that clear enough? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Good. It, it sounded to me like you're suggesting that you're really driven by um, trying to answer the question fully, do we take the incarnation seriously, uh, and do as we seriously take, as Scripture takes? And do we take the humanity of Jesus seriously? You know, because the later creeds say he was, or the later formulations like Chalcedon say, he's fully human as well as fully divine. And the fully human thing isn't just a kind of a kit that he does for the sake of, oh, he's got some difficult work to do, so too bad he has to come and be human for that, but, but we don't really emphasize that. No, the human vocation from Genesis through Psalm 8 all the way to Hebrews and Revelation, the human vocation is that the creator God has made a world in which he intends to act through human beings in order that he might himself act appropriately within his world by becoming a human being. This is built into the plan. It's not just a sort of faux demur, well, we've got to do it for the sake of. Can I pick up one last uh, thought on this point? So Philippians 2 begins with, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Could you draw out the implications for seeing the humanity of Christ for our own lives of imitating Christ? Absolutely, because I mean, that's, that's what Paul does with that verse, verse 5. He's drawing together verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are one of the most extraordinary appeals for church unity that you could ever imagine. And I've worked in real life church communities, and I know if you say to a community, I want you to think the same thoughts, be of the same mind, share the same love, you look around and you think, dream on, this is not going to happen here. Um, <laughs> But that's the appeal because it's an appeal for humility and for a discovery of what it means to be a Christian, to be a Messiah person in terms of self-giving love, which is what the world was made by. God made a world that is other than himself. That only makes sense if God is a God of overflowing self-giving love. And then immediately after the poem, you get the other half of the appeal, which is an appeal for holiness, to shine like lights in the world. And those are the things that, which, again, demands self-giving love because all the things that make us less than holy are when we are grasping at things and worshipping idols and so on. So having the mind of the Messiah at that point, which I think Paul would say, he doesn't say in that passage, but he would say this only happens by the Spirit, um, that is about becoming 
Messiah-like people, which is just a huge challenge for us all. This next question is one that doesn't come uh, directly out of Simply Christian, but it's a question that many, many students have because they come to Wheaton College and they, they see that we're reading a, uh, one of your books and, and they've heard your name before because perhaps they've been, they've been told about you by people whom they trust who are concerned that you um, undermine the, the Reformation understanding of justification by grace through faith alone in Christ alone because of your talk of, of works and they're worried about works righteousness. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the doctrine of justification and where works fit in with mm. that. I, I, when I was finishing Simply Christian, I think I remember dimly thinking to myself, I don't think I've gone into justification here. Isn't that interesting? Um, and of course, I, I wrote a book on justification just two years after that, so that's the, the fuller answer. And I actually just, um, just over a week ago, I did a full hours lecture to the class I teach on Paul about justification. So what I will say now is a, a very small snippet of something that could be spelt out much more. Look at it like this. God intends to put the whole world right. That's there in the Psalms, it's there in Isaiah, it's there in Revelation, and actually it's built into Genesis. God makes a world and he's not going to be satisfied with it being messed up. God's going to put the whole world right. God has dramatically launched that project by raising Jesus from the dead, which is the putting right of the crucifixion of the Messiah. We live in between the launching of the putting right project and the completion of the putting right project. And God puts us right in the present so that we can be part of his putting right project for the world. That's how justification and justice go together. Shall I just say it again? God is going to put the world right. He puts us right in the present on the basis of his action in Jesus so that we can be part of his putting right project for the world. Paul says in Philippians 1, the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. That's a way of talking about the work of the gospel by the Spirit in someone's heart and life Paul never quite spells it out in the way that some 17th century theologians do with the Ordo Salutis, etc. But this is what he's getting at. God begins that work when you hear the gospel, when it grasps you, when you believe it. You are already, that minute, justified. God declares you are in the right. I have put you right. You are part of my covenant family. Your sins are forgiven. And the one who began that good work in you will complete it for the day of the Messiah. What does that look like, that completion? Does it look like me just sitting back and waiting? Every page in the New Testament says, no, the one who began that good work in you is going to carry it on. Not to make your justification a bit more topped up, but to do the things which mean that you are now part of God's putting right project for the world. In other words, as with Romans 2, when you look at the eschatological, the ultimate day of judgment, Paul is absolutely clear to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Does that mean Paul is adding a bit of works to justification by faith? Absolutely not. Romans 2 is about the future justification. Romans 3, justification by faith, is the anticipation of that in the present on the basis of faith, on the basis of the work of Christ, the basis of faith. So how many solaces do you want? Is that enough? Um, uh, but the idea... The, oh dear, if you even mention works, you're in danger of corrupting this. You know, as I said, just, just read, take a couple of days and just read through the New Testament and ask yourself if this makes sense or not. It's, this is not me saying it. The New Testament insists that if you belong to the Messiah, if you're indwelt by the Spirit, then there is a life which has to be led. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live by the Spirit, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Is that adding these works of putting to death the deeds of the body? Is Paul supplementing justification? No, he isn't. He's talking about the future judgment which will be on the basis of the totality of the life led. Get used to the distinction between the future day and the present justification on the basis of faith. One other thing 
um, and then come back with details if you like, but I'll just say this. There are three passages where Paul expounds justification. There is Galatians, of course, particularly chapters 3 and 4, but particularly chapter 3 and the end of chapter 2. There is Philippians chapter 3, the first half roughly of Philippians chapter 3, and there is Romans, particularly Romans uh, 2, 3, and 4, and then uh, summarized again in Romans 10. Only in Romans do we have law court language. In Galatians and Philippians, what Paul is talking about very clearly, very explicitly, is Jews and Gentiles being declared to be part of the single family of Abraham. Is that substituting sociology for theology? Absolutely not, because God's whole purpose in calling Abraham was to found and launch a single ultimate family whose sins were forgiven. The call of Abraham reverses the problem of Adam. So the Abraham family is by definition the sin-forgiven family because of the death of Jesus, which has defeated the powers and now uh, launches this single family. So the coming together of Jew and Gentile or the transformation of the, the Israel that Paul grew up in into this extended and enlarged Israel that he now thinks he's part of. This is not something other than justification. This is justification. And you need to know it because you need to know who you're supposed to sit down and eat with. And the fact that there are no ethnic divisions in the people of God. And the fact that the reformers so stressed Romans and a forensic law court just, uh, justification, which is there in Romans in spades, often led some of them and some of their successors to forget what Galatians and Philippians are all about, which is that this is part of the definition of the people of God and not about how we go to heaven at the end. And it's, it's actually, again, the going to heaven stuff which drove that, I think, in the 16th century. Now, I've just said a lot of rather technical things. Sorry if this is over your head or under your feet or whatever. There's much more that could be said, but that's for starters. Well, and you mentioned the, the 16th century context, and of course, we're at the 500th commemoration yeah. of the Reformation. Um, given your, your treatment of justification, uh, are there still things from Luther and Calvin that we can, can hold on to? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the big, big things that Luther was protesting at was the way that the doctrine of purgatory was not only being expounded but applied, and you had this idiot going around Germany collecting money in order to get Great Uncle Joe out of purgatory. And, and there were lots of um, people who we'd, we would today call Roman Catholics in France and Italy and elsewhere who were hearing about this and saying, this is crazy, this is nonsense, this must be stopped. But it was only Luther who nailed 95 theses to the door of the church. And uh, I would say, thank goodness, stump somebody stood up and said, purgatory is a gross distortion of Christian teaching and is, has led to all kinds of abuses and we have to say that is not how salvation works. Likewise, some of the practices associated with some of the theologies of the Eucharist in the late Middle Ages, uh, Luther and Calvin I think were absolutely right to say that is not what this is all about. And it was giving the priests supposed great almost magical power, etc. And they protested against that. And they were right. Now, the, the, the sad thing was that they and their successors in rejecting purgatory didn't go all the way to articulating a fully biblical eschatology. And in rejecting the sacrifice of the mass, um, I think Calvin went further than the rest in articulating a more biblical view of the Eucharist, because in Calvin's Eucharistic theology, he really does believe in the coming together of heaven and earth in the sacrament. I'm not sure that he and his British um, uh, followers, because some of the British theologians were getting some of the stuff from Calvinism. I'm not sure they fully articulated a heaven and earth theology, but they were holding on to something vital there. So those are two obvious ways where reform had to come, but maybe it didn't go far enough. And particularly, and this is one of the first things I learned as a theologian, that whatever question you're faced with, go back to the Bible and try again and find what the Bible was actually saying in, in its original context. That was Luther's agenda. That was the agenda of one of my lifetime here 
here as William Tyndale, um, burnt at the stake in 1535 for translating the Bible into English. And it was the, uh, at the heart of what Calvin and the others were all about. That's been my agenda from the age of about 22 onwards, and I intend to stick to it, God willing, all my life. Whatever the question, go back and try and find out even better what the Bible has to say on the subject. That's great, and every generation has to do it. And in five years, 10 years, 20 years time, people will be saying the same about me. Well, too bad N.T. Wright didn't really follow through his own agenda. That's the agenda that we've got to follow. And they, they articulated it. Well, if, if you drive up to our campus, as you know, Wheaton College exists for Christ and his kingdom. Yep. And we also have a uh, strategic priority for our college that we want to deepen ethnic diversity. So racial and ethnic diversity is very important. And we, we talk about deepening it in that we're not just wanting people here, we want to, to to make diversity part of our life and to, um, to make, it, make our campus richer and deeper in and through the engagement with people from diverse cultures and diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. Could you draw a connection for us between the kingdom of God and Jesus and the pursuit of ethnic and racial diversity. Yeah, th this is a fascinating one because one of the things we learn historically when we look at the world of um, Jesus and Paul and the early church is that the ethnic question was totally different to how we perceive it. Because if you live in the Middle East to this day, and if you live in a culture where people are crossing over from North Africa to Greece and back again and coming and going, the color of your skin is relatively unimportant. Sometimes if somebody arrived in Rome who'd come from what we would call Central Africa, people might remark on the fact that their skin was really very black as opposed to mildly black or whatever, but skin pigmentation covered all kinds of different varieties and most people didn't bother about it. The biggest division, which we see in the New Testament, however, is between Jews and non-Jews. That the Jews are very clear, there's a wall of separation, that non-Jews are different and Jews have to stay within the family and they have cultural symbols which keep them within the family. And the whole point of the gospel as applied in Galatians 2, 11 to 21, for instance, is that in the Messiah, that wall has gone. Now, here's the point, that as long as the reformers started a movement saying that justification is about how you can be sure in the presence that you're going to heaven when you die, they were able to ignore the ethnic inclusion aspect of justification. And that got forgotten in the drive to have the Bible and liturgy in one's own language. So you got different ethnic churches springing up, which then started to instantiate different socio-cultural values, which got muddled up with different theologies. And nobody noticed that that was radically wrong in terms of the New Testament. So when you talk about Jesus as king and the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God, what you're talking about is Jesus being the Lord of the whole world and of it being gloriously diverse and intending to stay that way. And if you read Revelation, this wonderful vision of the, the, the myriad of, of, of the redeemed praising God, they're from every nation and kindred and tribe and tongue. And obviously it's hard to take a society like modern Britain or like modern America or modern many other places and just say, okay, you've got to do diversity because it takes time. But that's got to be the goal because if you don't do that, what you're saying is actually we, we still quite like our cultural barriers and distinctives. And if you read Romans 14, Paul is very clever because Part of the problem in Rome is you've got these different house churches, which probably they're people who've come from different parts of the Roman Empire, and they're sticking to their traditions. And Paul doesn't say, some of you are Jews and some of you are Gentiles. He says, some of us like to eat only vegetables, and others are quite happy to eat meat and whatever. Some of us like to keep special days holy, and others aren't too bothered about it. So let's not judge one another. The aim is that with one heart and voice, you glorify the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus. In other words, Ethnic integration is, is at the ground level of the gospel. It's not an extra bit of something rather special for those who think they can manage it. It's absolutely basic and it, it's built in from the beginning. Could you apply this same question to, in contemporary debates, often these are linked to debates about immigration and uh, the treatment of immigrants yeah. uh, by um, a certain nationality. It's certainly a theme in the Bible. Um, yeah. Do you have any yeah. thoughts yeah. about how we can apply the biblical teaching about immigration and what we see both in 
the Old Testament and the New Testament about aliens, exiles, welcoming foreigners yep. Yep. to our contemporary yep. situation. Yeah, I mean, th th this, is, this is tough. I, I live in what is basically rather a small island. I mean, as you probably know, you could put the entire British Isles, um, if you turn it on its side, into about half of North Carolina. I once did that on a map, something like that anyway. And we are a small island, and we are overpopulated. Um, not evenly spread. There are some bits which are very dense and others, like parts of Scotland, which are very empty. But there are many people in Britain who say, wait a minute, it's not wise, it's not just, just to say what Angela Merkel said in Germany, let as many come as want to come. Um, this is a debate which many people have when they look across from Britain to Germany and say, was Angela Merkel right or was she being stupid? And I think all her instincts were right. She's a, a pastor's daughter from East Germany. She knew what it was like to be oppressed, etc. And she has a deep heart level sympathy. Uh, I think a Christian sympathy for um, people who've been appallingly treated. And here's part of the problem here that we saw this with the Arab Spring and we've seen it ever since. What's going on when all these boatloads of migrants are leaving Libya and trying to get to Europe is the long-term result of the Western Enlightenment, of the Enlightenment, as it were, pulling up the ladder and saying, we're all right, and out there there are some funny people who do things differently and we're not going to bother about them, unless if they get in our way, we'll go and drop bombs on them and that'll teach them a lesson. You know, and, and what we are seeing is actually a very long-term result of a very long-term set of Western attitudes. And so it ill behoves us to say, oh no, you, you go back where you came from because we're full enough. At the same time, um, countries are different sizes, islands are different sizes. There is a modicum of justice and wisdom. This is why we need more international cooperation in terms of whether it's UN-led or what, I know that in America the UN is often a dirty word, people don't like the United Nations, but either we have a laissez-faire thing where every country does its own thing and who cares, and then that, that's actually a very dangerous situation, or we have some form of coordination where we say, as people didn't say at the start of the war when a lot of people knew that the Jewish people were being persecuted in Germany, they should have said, let's get together all the rest of us and see how we can help. Um, they said, no, we'll have a quota. We'll just let in so many, and, and we'll be a bit rude to them when they arrive, and so on. You know, we've got to do better than that for the next generation. I, I once, in a, in a Christmas sermon in Durham Cathedral, um, uh, there was a huge thing because the British government have a policy or had a policy about asylum seekers that people would arrive desperate with nothing who were in deep trouble in their own country, desperate for asylum, and they would put them on buses and send them to reception areas in different parts of the country. One of those reception areas was right in a key place in my diocese. So I got to know about this and worked with some of them and people who were helping them. And I mentioned it in a sermon at Christmas time. I said something about the need to help the asylum seekers. And on the way out of church, I was shaking hands with about 2,000 people. This is at midnight on, on Christmas Eve. And one person said, was it you who preached that sermon? And I said, um, yes, it was. And he said, well, you should stick to the text. Christmas has nothing to do with asylum seekers. And he marched out. <laughs> and I was left speechless. I wanted to just go read Matthew 2, for goodness sake. Um, uh, Jesus himself was an asylum seeker as a baby with a price on his head. You know, where, where are we coming from if we forget that? Okay, enough said. Uh, another question that comes from Simply Christian, and um, not, it, it, it'll affect not only people who have read that book, but I think all of our students, has to do with the authority of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, we take the Bible seriously here, and, and many students um, think about, can I trust this Bible? Is it trustworthy? Is it really the Word of God? Um, how do I take up and read it? So we'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your understanding of yeah. the authority of the Bible as yeah. the Word of God, yeah, yeah, how yeah. we read it. Yeah. And the Bible itself doesn't usually refer to itself as the Word of God. The phrase Word of God comes more in the prophetic literature where the prophet is saying, this is the Word of the Lord or whatever. And in the New Testament, of course, classically, in John's Gospel, the Word of God is Jesus himself. So that the phrase Word of God is a shorthand. We have to get used to dealing with shorthands and not to, being fooled, not to be being fooled by them. Um, what do I mean? Um, Lots of Christian doctrines function as portable stories. We were talking last night, I was talking last night about the atonement. The word atonement is actually a shorthand a word or phrase 
for saying the Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures and a few other things besides. If you wanted to discuss atonement and had to say the Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures, every time you mentioned it, that would be a very long lecture or discussion. So we fold it up like putting clothes in a suitcase and we call it atonement. But when we get to the other end, we do what we do with clothes in a suitcase. We get them out and we hang them in the wardrobe or we put them on. In other words, we have to remind ourselves that what really counts is the story that this shorthand phrase is telling. What is the story that the phrase, the word of God is applied to the Bible is telling? It goes something like this, that Israel as the people of God found that again and again, people rose up from their midst who had the gift of song and poetry, who had the gift of history writing and storytelling, etc., and that these stories formed and shaped the community in order to be the people that God wanted that community to be, or in order, when they weren't being the people that God wanted that community to be, to warn them of the dire consequences that were coming as a result, and then what God might do about it. In other words, it's a story about a people living with God and God inspiring some people to write things which are warning and promise and command and all the rest of it. And then when Jesus comes, and Hebrews makes it quite clear, in sundry times and diverse ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken through a son. Jesus himself is the living word of God. But then the New Testament grows up quickly in the first generation or so because God calls and equips people like Paul and Luke and the rest uh, to do their homework, to study their scriptures, to amass the history, if you're Luke or whoever, and then to write it in such a way as it will be community forming for this renewed, enlarged, reconstituted Israel we call the church. Now, that is what I mean when I say the Bible is the word of God. I'm telling a story about a community being driven by God to be his people. It's about God's mission in the world ahead of the day when he will make all things new and God equipping the church with what it needs to be the people. And particularly, it's not enough to say that God would equip us simply by breathing his spirit on people who go and do things. That happens. But God wants us to be grown up in our thinking. One of the things that happens in the New Testament is a challenge to be mature intellectually. Here we are in a college. This is what it's all about. Paul says, I don't want you to be babies in your thinking. Be grown up in your thinking. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so precisely Christianity is a writing and bookish religion from the beginning in a way which, okay, it was true in Israel, but it's even more true in Christianity. So the Bible is the vehicle, not just of true information about God, but of the way in which we are in every generation to be challenged to grow up and be transformed in our thinking. And, and, and books do that, and the Gospels and Epistles and Revelation do that. Um, having said all that, remember that in Matthew 28, Jesus does not say to his followers, the risen Jesus does not say to his followers, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to the books you people are gonna go and write. He says all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. So when we talk about the authority of the Bible, as I do happily, that itself is a shorthand for God's authority vested in Jesus, exercised by the Spirit through the scriptures which his people write. You have to remind yourself that the shorthands mean what they mean as shorthands for that larger narrative. Thank you. If I could add, um, ask a follow-up question to that, it's obvious to everyone in the room that you have spent countless hours and days and months and years studying the Bible uh, as an academic, as a professor, as you teach, as you write. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, devotional reading of the Bible, um, if you have specific devotional practices or as a preacher uh, reading the Bible. Somebody told me when I was starting in seminary a thousand years ago that I should have two different Bibles, one for academic work and the other for devotional use. That was one of those pieces of advice that as soon as I heard it, I knew it was rubbish. Um, <laughs> that I was not going to live in a bifurcated world where my mind would be over there and my heart would be over there. We are told to love God with our heart and mind and soul and strength, and that has to be 
as integrated as we can. So though I've had different copies of the Bible which have worn out and fallen apart over the years and I've got new ones, um, the same Greek Testament, which is actually sitting in my black bag down there, is the te Greek Testament I put on the desk when I'm writing an article or working on a book, and it's the same Greek Testament that I have when I'm saying my prayers in the morning. And that's been so, and it's now looking a bit battered, and sooner or later I'll get another one. But that, that's my aim, ditto with the Hebrew Old Testament. Um, that, uh, so, because it may, maybe this, this may be, a, 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 again, a personality thing that I just find this works for me. There may be some people and there may be some times in your life, particularly if you're new to biblical studies in an, as an academic discipline and it's very strange and very awkward and, and you can't really cope with it, maybe you do need to get for a short time a different Bible that you can say your prayers with so that it won't remind you of the essay that you have to write or the awkward professor who's been trying to teach you about the synoptic problem or whatever it is. Um, you know, so, but that would be that would would be like a, a short-term solution for an awkward moment rather than something which you should settle for forever. And I would say as much as you possibly can um, integrate mind and heart and work at that. And when it's difficult, pray about the fact that it's difficult. Uh, and, and don't expect, as I said in chapel yesterday, don't expect to solve all the problems by, by next weekend. Um, you will live for years maybe with passages of scripture which are deeply puzzling and perhaps disturbing. And you just have to say, well, there it is, Lord. Uh, I, I, why would I expect to be able to understand it all straight off? This is an extraordinary, great, sprawling world in, into which I am invited to come and find my way about. Um, and, and I thank you for the things I can understand, and I hope that one day I will understand that as well. And it's been my experience and that of many, many others, that that's a prayer which God will answer, probably not as soon as we want, but it, one day you will come round a corner and you'll suddenly see that whole issue from quite a different light. So for me... Um, uh, I'm, I'm a morning person. Uh, I, I, I do say a short evening prayer, and I'm praying at different times during the day, but I like to front load the day. I will spend significant time in the morning with a large pot of tea and a Greek and Hebrew text and, and pray for people and so on. Thank you. One of the chapters in Simply Christian is about Israel, and some students asked about how, as a Christian, we should relate to ancient Israel and read the Old Testament. So picking up on how we read Scripture, how can we as a Christian approach um, this people? Most of us are Gentiles, so as Gentiles, entering into the story of another people. Mm -hmm. um, talking about that, and then maybe relating, some students ask questions about contemporary Israel, mm -hmm. the state of Israel, and how Christians should relate to that. So yeah, a two-part yeah. question. Uh, I, I would start really by saying, uh, just read Matthew 1 and think about the genealogy and think, why did Matthew think it was worthwhile to say who begat, who begat, who begat, who, all through from Abraham to Jesus? And the answer is that Jesus means what he means as the seventh seven. This is, this is the climax of the story. It's very clear in Matthew. Or start with John, who begins in the beginning, which is a clear echo of Genesis 1. All the Gospels are saying in their different ways, you will only understand the story we are telling you if you see it as the long, strange, unexpected fulfillment of this story. Now, the fact that it's strange and unexpected is important. Nobody in Jesus' day, before Jesus himself, was reading the Old Testament saying, ah, I see, what we're going to have is a Messiah called Jesus who will be crucified and raised from the dead and that will do this and this. No, this is totally unexpected. However, as the disciples on the road to Emmaus found, once you put Jesus and his death and resurrection into the middle of the picture, you look back and you say, Oh my goodness, it all makes sense. How do we miss it? And that's the meaning it has. And then go from there to 1 Corinthians 10 and to Ephesians 2, because in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is narrating a largely Gentile church into the story of Israel in order to say, this is who you now are. He says, our forefathers, and they weren't their forefathers. Oh yes, they are now, because if you're Abraham's seed, this is your backstory. It's rather like when somebody marries into a family that has an interesting backstory. Supposing, um, maybe true of some of you, I don't know, you may have married or be about to marry somebody whose parents came as immigrants from some exotic faraway country and had a wild 
wild story about how they got there, etc. And you had a rather humdrum story about an ordinary growing up in a Midwestern town or whatever. But now you're going to be part of this family that has this story. And you have to learn how that works and what that means. And what's different now that you're here as opposed to the exotic place, etc., etc. Ephesians 2, Paul says, remember that you Gentiles once were strangers to the covenant of promise, separated from the people of God. But now you who once were far off have been brought near in the blood of Christ. So again and again, the New Testament is making exactly that point. When it comes to the present state of Israel, and I know this is a huge hot potato theologically as well as politically in the United States, um, my reading of it starts really with Paul saying in 2 Corinthians that all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. And the idea that some of the promises of God didn't find their yes in Christ, but were kind of put into abeyance for some future date, call it 1947, 1948 or something, um, happens to be when I was born. So naturally, I think that the promises of God were fulfilled then, uh, not. Um, also when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. It's an interesting time. Um, but uh, uh, that just makes no sense theologically. And actually, if you exalt the present state of Israel as though that is the real fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about return from exile, you miss the whole point of the New Testament that in Jesus, the real return from exile took place when Jesus of Nazareth came out of the tomb on Easter morning. And if you try and apply those ancient prophecies to the events of the late 1940s, then you are actually taking away from the theological significance of Jesus' resurrection. We're going to move on to um, a series of um, sort of short questions here that might deserve long answers or short answers. We'll see. Uh, we want to get out in a timely fashion, of course. Um, as an American Christian, I don't always see what this American Christianity looks like because I'm immersed in it. Um, since you are an outsider, the question <laughs> is, um, what do you see about the American church that you that you would encourage us to revisit, to rethink, to change? Yeah, I, I faced this when, when I published my big book on Paul some years ago, and I went around America because the publisher sent me on a kind of a trip, and people kept asking me if Paul could see modern Christianity, modern American Christianity, what would he be most surprised by? And I've said unhesitatingly, not just your disunity, but the fact that you don't care about it. Um, he would say, unity absolutely matters. If you wonder why Caesar, whoever you think Caesar is today, doesn't take any notice of the church, it's because we're disunited. Unity is costly. At least it's costly if you also care about holiness. Um, unity is comparatively easy if you don't care about holiness. Holiness is comparatively easy if you don't care about unity. You just split and do your own thing, which I think is the story of American church history. Um, the trick is to do unity and holiness together, and that's difficult. But I think that the dis it's not only the radical disunity, but the fact that nobody has noticed that that's a problem. This is an interesting question from a student. If you could have one giant billboard with anything on it, metaphorically speaking, getting a message out to millions and billions of people, and it could be from a word to a paragraph in length, what would it say and why? <laughs> It would have to have the word Jesus right in the middle of it somewhere, and it would have to say something about the unexpected sovereignty of Jesus over the world. Now, that isn't a billboard slogan, but, it, and, but part of our difficulty is that when we say the phrase Jesus is Lord, if we are savvy about the Bible, we know that the word Lord is simultaneously the word which echoed the Septuagint word for Israel's God, Yahweh, Kyrios, Lord, and also one of the key titles which Caesar claimed for himself. We don't sadly have a word which will do both of those jobs neatly in contemporary English or perhaps any modern language, but I would want to say something which stressed that Jesus is the unexpected sovereign through whom the world is being put right, um, and shock people with that but to say it in such a way that really means Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. 
You know, we, we must never forget that in Thessalonica, when Paul preached the gospel, they accused him of saying that there is another king, namely Jesus. And one of the things that I like to challenge people with is, if they heard you preaching a sermon, would they go down the street and say, this person thinks there's another president called Jesus? Um, the, the trouble with that, you see, your word president, is that a president is in elected office for a short term. Jesus was not elected and it was not for a short term. He was appointed by God and it's forever. So if you could give every student in this room a book as a gift, other than the Bible or one of your own books, <laughs> what book would you give them and why? I, I, I was warned about this question and I scratch my head about it because people often ask me, you know, what are the three favorite books or the books that you would take to a desert island? And, and I'm funny like this. I would take the um, Oxford uh, Classical Dictionary and the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church because they are both absolute mines of wonderful information and I love pulling them off the shelf and just wallowing in them. But perhaps not everybody in this room would share my <laughs> quirky tastes. Um, so I thought about this and actually I, my, my best answer would be the new Oxford Book of Christian Verse. It's comparatively recent collection, um, and it takes you from some of the wonderful medieval Christian poetry right through to the modern period. And unlike many collections of po poems, there are lots of poems by women. There are quite a few poems by modern American poets in there, as well as some of the greats from George Herbert and John Donne and so on. And my guess is that most people in this room have studied some poetry at some point but probably not got nearly as far as they might, and that one of the things we most urgently need in Western culture right now is to have our imaginations opened in such a way as to glimpse new vistas of Christian truth. And reading poets, particularly poets from other generations and periods than our own, is a wonderful way, as well as just being a richly humanizing and delightful experience. So the new Oxford Book of Christian Verse be a wonderful thing to have. It's coming up to Christmas present buying time, so go get it. Uh, what has your work as a minister and as a bishop taught you about Christ, about God, about the church, um, perhaps that you, you didn't learn in your academic study? <laughs> All sorts of things. I mean, one of the wonderful things about being a theologian and a priest, uh, minister, pastor, whatever, is that it's a, it's a rich two-way street. And when you're working on some tricky academic problem, you may suddenly see something that you think, oh, I have to preach about that next week. Wonderful. And it happens the other way, that you can be leading a, a Bible study with untrained, unschooled people in a little village, and suddenly something will spring off the page, and you think, as soon as I get home, I'm going to check out some commentaries on that. And so that rich to and fro has often, often happened to me, and it's one of the delights of the job. I think um, what you learn through doing real ministry is uh, the, the, the rich complexity of human life which when you're studying theology and even studying the Bible, though it should tell you about that, you tend to flatten it out and you tend to talk about humans or whatever. And then when you get to know real humans, they're all different and they're all richly exciting and frustrating and goodness knows what. And the, the thing about... I remember some years ago, Ed Sanders, one of the great New Testament scholars of the last generation, said something extraordinary about how um, Jesus couldn't have spoken against the law or Paul wouldn't have needed to speak against the law. And I heard him say that at a conference once and I, I took the microphone and it was my turn and I said, nobody who's worked in a church would ever imagine that just because somebody in authority has said something, this question will never need to be raised again. You know, Real life just isn't like that. And I think you learn about the grittiness of it. And then you go back and you see Paul wrestling with pastoral issues in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. And he's navigating a tricky set of circumstances. And it's not even a one law for the whole time. It's this is how we're going to do it now as a sort of a holding job. And you realize that's real pastoral practice. 
because you can't just go into a church and say, I've studied theology, I know the answers, so we're going to do this, this, and this, and it'll all be perfect. And you've got to pray with these people, you've got to love these people, you've got to weep with these people, you've got to feel where they're coming from and the tensions within that community. And then you'll discover that the New Testament will come alongside and help you with that. Well, this is going to be our final question. Um, if you look out here, you have hundreds of young Christian students. I know them very well. They are committed to Jesus. They want to serve the church. They want to serve the kingdom of God. They love God. They are going to commit their lives to a vocation of, of loving their neighbor as themselves and loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, they're going to end up in many different careers. How would you guide them as they live their vocation as a Christian, as they're pursuing these various careers? How would you commission them? If you were asked to commission them on that service and commission them for that life, mm. what would you tell them to look ahead towards and what practices would they need along the way? That's a great question. Um, the, the, the obvious old fashioned answers remain absolutely central that uh, scripture, prayer, public worship, including sacraments, and service to the poor. Those are the ways in the New Testament where we are told not only will God meet us, God will show up, not necessarily when we want or how we want, but these are the places where God has covenanted to meet with his people, scripture, prayer, sacrament, public worship, and the service of the poor. Think Matthew 25, in as much as you did it to the least of these. Um, it's, it, it, in Britain, we used to have, this is a rather odd way of getting at it, in Britain, we used to have an odd form of horse racing, which still does happen in country areas called point to point, where there wasn't actually a set track. It was just that the people had to start riding there and they had to end up over there. And if they chose to go over that hedge or through that gate, it was just from the point to point. And I want to say it's like a sort of point to point that your use of scripture, the way you pray, please get a spiritual director at some point because sooner or later in your life you're going to need to figure out this is how I learned to pray when I was younger and it doesn't seem to me quite right now and are there other ways I could be praying which would help me grow as a person and as a etc etc. So scripture, prayer, and scripture you'll all read scripture differently but you must be reading it regularly, you must be reading the whole Bible regularly, you must be always studying some bit um, in detail and if you're not doing that you will be going backwards. If you're not doing that, things will slowly happen in your life which you won't realize at the time until it's perhaps too late that you'll have been sidelined, gone off track somewhere. So the whole scripture, a life of prayer, a life of public worship and joining in with the sacramental life of the church, and then whatever service to the poor looks like where you are, point to point, it'll be different. There'll be a different way around these four points for everybody here. But if you're doing that, um, then God will guide you. And as I think I said in my sermon yesterday, we get the, the guidance we need, which is usually not quite what we wanted, and we'll get it when we need it, which is usually a lot later than we wanted it. And that teaches us patience and humility, and you'll need that. You know, I've worked with students most of my life, and uh, as students, you, 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 you have, have some goals, fine, that's wonderful, dream dreams, see visions, pray for wisdom, but then expect that you have to get into your stride through your 30s and 40s and 50s and beyond because there are long stretches when it won't be particularly exciting and it won't be particularly dramatic. I, I, I get the prayer letter from one of the um, British missionary organizations, CMS, Church Missionary Society, and day by day I pray for people working around the world and when I read what they are doing often it's stuff which isn't particularly dramatic it's we need to choose a new headmaster for this school in Tanzania please join us in praying for this or we've just started this home group for single mothers in in somewhere in Southeast Asia and please pray that we, and you know there's just a lot of hard work organization wisdom humility getting on with the job once in a while there'll be something dramatic to write home about most of it is patient humble kingdom building but if you're doing it it won't be humdrum because Jesus will be there with you and you will sense that and the love that you have for him now will shine through in ways that you perhaps won't realize until much later so God will be with you uh, your part is to be faithful to that calling and just see where it's going to be. Tailpiece, 
I had to revise a book that I wrote in 1992, which was a book about bringing the church to the world and what that looks like. And I had to go through and revise it the other day, and I realized there were two major things that have happened since 1992, which we'd none of us seen coming. They both begin with I, the internet, and Islamism. And suddenly you realize that in the last 25 years, the world has changed. That's going to happen again. We don't know what the next two big things are going to be that will radically change the world into which you go as missionaries of Christ. All I can say is that if you're doing those four things, you will find that you are equipped to meet those new challenges. God bless you. And with that, we, we thought we would close. It's not every day you have a bishop on the Wheaton campus. We thought we would have uh, Bishop Wright, former Bishop Wright, give us a blessing to yeah. close. Can, can we stand, please? You don't have to stand to be blessed, but I think it helps, actually. Just to, yeah. um, Let's just pause and be still for a moment. So may Almighty God make you faithful to his calling, cheerful in his service, and fruitful for his kingdom. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and through you with all those to whom he sends you, now and always. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much.